Well, welcome again. So glad that you are here uh, in this space uh, and worshiping alongside us. Those of you who are uh, online, we certainly hope that you are blessed this morning. We hope that uh, you find uh, the time engaging online. But if you and when and if you are able, we would love to invite you to come join us uh, in person. Uh, so we know that that welcome is always there. The, uh, this morning, we are continuing in this short little teaching series that we're calling A Different Way. We're considering, realistically, what would it look like if we, as a fellowship, as a church body, kind of operated our church or operated our fellowship in a way that was keeping with the values and the person of Jesus. I mean, after all, we are Jesus people. We are people who are learning to live Jesus' life if he were living our life, learning to live his way of living individually, but now we're asking, what does that look like for us corporately? How do we live distinctively different lives as a fellowship, as a family of believers? What does it look like for us to do that? And when we shape our gatherings in this kind of way, it would be like having cold water on a hot day for people. It would be refreshing to our souls. It would bring a peace and a longing or, and a belonging sense to those around us. It would bring deep satisfaction to the souls of people that feel like they're isolated and forgotten and on their own out there in the world. We would find ourselves, in other words, we would find ourselves transmitting hope to those who are lonely and hurting and isolated and forgotten. We would find ourselves as a fellowship, as a church, people who are transmitting hope. And we wouldn't be transmitting hope because of our well-articulated theological arguments or our debates or how well we post on social media, but we would be transmitting hope because we are living as a distinct people shaped by a distinct way. And the way in which we operate, the way in which we handle ourselves as a fellowship is distinctively different than the world around us. And while God is bigger, much, much bigger than our minds can fully understand and our finite minds cannot fully grasp the infinite nature of God. In fact, I suspect we will spend much of eternity learning more and growing in our deep understanding of who God is. He is that infinite and beyond us. And yet at the same time, he has revealed himself to us. He has shown us what he is like, what is at the core and the heart of who God, because God has revealed himself in the incarnation of Jesus. That when we look at Jesus, we see the exact representation of what God is like. If we want to know what God is like, we take a look at Jesus which means the entire life of Jesus, what he does, where he goes, who he interacts with, how he teaches, his words, everything about Jesus is an exact representation of the nature and the character of God. And if we want to live a distinctively different life, both individually and collectively as his people, we ought to look at Jesus. And as we study the life of Jesus, there's always this great invitation to join in with him, to, to draw our life into his life, to, to join with what he is doing. And when that happens, both individually and as a fellowship, when that happens, we will increasingly be characterized by the nature and the values of God. And we will be shaped in a different way. And my belief is as we learn to live this different way, we'll not only see ourselves differently, we'll see our neighbors and coworkers and family members differently, we'll see each other differently, and in my humble opinion, we will really transmit hope. We will be a place that is refreshing and restorative and will be good. And we won't even, we won't just give good news, but we will be good news in our community and in our families, and in our neighborhoods. Well, last week we looked at the way that Jesus welcomes people. This uncanny ability to welcome people from all walks of life. Those who have lots, those who don't have lots. Those who have a spiritual pedigree, and those who don't know anything about God. He has this uncanny ability to welcome, to create space, to invite people to sit at his table, and he share a meal with them, and to create this welcoming atmosphere. And we talked about what that looked like for us to be a place where people can belong, 
to have a place at our fellowship, to have a place, a space where people who are far from God, a people who have been walking with God for decades, for people who know lots and people who don't know lots, people who have lots and people who don't have lots. There's a welcome at this place that there's a space for people to come and to be uh, belong in a new fellowship and a new family to extend that same kind of welcome. Because the radical welcome of Jesus welcomes people and it gives them, who once they once felt like isolated and alone and off on their own, it gives them a place in a new family. And it satisfies the deep human need for community. It satisfies the deep human need that each one of us carry within ourselves this need for community, need to belong. And the way of Jesus is a way of welcoming to invite people into that. We asked the question last week, what would it look like for us to not only extend a welcome, but to invite people to walk with them, to create space for them to sit down and to learn and be curious about life with God? We asked that kind of question, and again, not just to give good news, but to be good news in our community. Well, this morning, we're going to turn the page a little bit, and this morning, I want to look at the compassion of God. When we see the compassion of of Jesus. And I want you to remember that Jesus in his life and what he is doing, how he speaks and where he goes and what he does, all of what he is doing is revealing the heart of God, the, the nature of God. So what we see in Jesus when we see the compassion of Jesus is we see the compassion of God. And that compassion is inviting us into that life where we would be shaped and molded and directed into that kind of a way that we would give that kind of a nature, that kind of character away. So I do have a passage I'm going to look into, but before we jump into that, I want to give us just kind of a broad overview of the life of Jesus and how we see this compassion of Jesus as we see the love and the mercy and the grace and the gentleness of Jesus. Uh, Just kind of a bird's eye view. And the first way we see it is we see the compassion of Jesus' ministry, what he does when he walks around. He heals those with leprosy. He feeds the hungry, the multitudes. He returns the dignity of a man who was tortured by demons for a long time. He restores his dignity. He meets the needs of others. He sees their needs and with compassion, driven with compassion, he meets the needs of those around him, cares for them. So you see the compassion of Jesus in his actual ministry, his action, what he did, where he went, willing to touch those that others had declared were unclean, but he was willing to touch and be known and to talk with them and to see them as human beings and not just to write them off like everybody else. So you see the compassion in Jesus in his ministry. But not only do you see the compassion in Jesus' ministry, but you hear compassion in the way in which he speaks his words to people, how he responds verbally to those that he interacts with is full of compassion, grace, and gentleness. He's never overbearing. He's never full full of shame or of ridicule because you hear it in the way he speaks to a woman at the well. A woman, by the way, who has a past and had been brushed off by her cultural society, but he acknowledges her he acknowledges her as a, as a human being, doesn't heap guilt or shame over her, but the way he speaks to her, he speaks to her as a human being made in the image and the likeness of God. You hear it in the way in which he forgives the sin of a man who is needing forgiveness. You see it in the way in which he blesses the children as they gather around him. These are all ways, and and I'm sure you can think of more. We can brainstorm a whole lot more, but just enough to see that he demonstrates compassion in not only his ministry, his action, but his words. And the point is real simple. Whether it was words or it was action, Jesus always operated from a place of compassion, for love for others, meeting the needs of them where they were because he saw them with the heart of God. As he demonstrates the heart of God is full of compassion and love and mercy and patience and gentleness. This is what we see in the way of God. And so when we talk about becoming a place that is distinctive and is driven by the value of Jesus, then we have to talk about becoming a place of compassion. And that will entail meeting the needs of others. 
seeing them as human beings and not writing them off or or distancing them like much of our culture is used to doing. It would recognize the image of God is within every human being, restoring them to health emotionally, physically, relationally, familially. We would draw them in to a life together, all with gentleness and mercy, patience, all driven for compassion. Because the way of Jesus, whether it was by words or by deeds, the way of Jesus is a way of compassion. He was full. His way is not to place a heavy burden of shame on you or on me for not measuring up or or not being good enough in some way. But his way was always full of compassion and patience and inviting us to a deeper, more meaningful, significant life. All from a heart of compassion. But not only does Jesus live from a place of compassion in his ministry and his words, but he also teaches us about the heart of God in compassion. He teaches us through illustrations and parables and, and teaching along the way. Perhaps one of the most well-known parables that Jesus ever taught is found in Luke chapter 15. It's called the parable of the prodigal son. Many of you, I'm sure, will remember the story, but it's a story of the younger brother who asks his father for his share of the inheritance early before his father had passed away, which would have been disgraceful enough, would have been a slap in the face enough. But to make matters worse, he quickly loses his inheritance due to wild and unrighteous living, just kind of wastes it away. And in this parable, Jesus is teaching the father is... God, who God is represented by the Father in this parable. And after some time of wild living and wasting all of his father's inheritance, the, the son decides to come back. And he doesn't come back as a son. He comes back and says, I'm not worthy. I've wasted it all. My father would never accept me, would never bring me back into his family, but I'll be a servant. I'll be a hired servant. And so he gets enough courage to become a hired servant and he he makes a long trek back. And one had all sorts of understanding or all sorts of responses that the father may have said over the son that wasted his inheritance, that slapped him across the face and then wasted all of his inheritance in quick, wild and disgraceful kind of living. And the son knew that he had no right to ask to be a son again. He had no right to ask to be part of the family again. I'll just be one of your servants. But somehow he comes to his father, and we don't know how his father is going to respond. The early listeners don't know what Jesus is going to say. But then Jesus says these very powerful words in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 20. While he, meaning the son, while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What you see Jesus teaching us is the heart of the Father was filled with compassion. Filled. And when you are filled with something, you can't have anything else. There's no disappointment. There's no ridicule. There's no blame. The Father's heart is filled with compassion. I want you to notice the progression in the parable. While he was still a long way off, the Father sees him. He sees him. His eyes were looking and had compassion. But his compassion isn't limited to his eyes because he sees him. And then Jesus says there was something in his heart for his heart was filled with compassion. But it wasn't just his eyes saw and his heart was filled, but it moved to his feet. 
and his legs, and he ran to his son. And it wasn't just his legs and his feet, but his arms wrapped him in an embrace and his lips kissed him. Because when you are full of compassion, it consumes your whole being. It consumes all of you. It's not just his eyes, it's not just his heart, but his legs, his arms, his lips, his whole being is consumed with compassion. And what Jesus is teaching us, modeling for us, speaking to us, and teaching us is that the whole being of God is filled with compassion and love and tenderhearted mercy. And perhaps most vividly, what we see in Jesus, the compassion of Jesus is displayed most vividly on the cross where Jesus absorbs all the tyrannical governmental corruption around him and all the religious institution that is blinded by legalism, a, a bloodthirsty crowd that is crying out for his demise. And while he's hanging on the cross and he is choking on his own blood, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The entire being of God is consumed with compassion. It's the nature of who God is. And he will deal with our sin. And he will invite us to lay our lives down, to put aside our old ways, to pick up new ways. But it will never be done through shame and ridicule and with a heavy burden to break us. But it will always come from a heart of compassion, patient and gentle, calling us to a better way, calling us to a transformed life. But the invitation to lay aside our old way and to learn a new way always comes from a place that is driven from the compassion of God, the grace of God. And it is this compassion, it is this all-consuming love and compassion that his people ought to be known for, that his churches ought to be a distinct gathering because the compassion of God so fills our place. Because when we follow Jesus, then we want his ways and his values to shape us both individually and us as a gathering. See, we want to be a place when people encounter the powerful truth of God in ways that equip them to live out the life that God has prepared for them. And yeah, that will mean laying aside their old ways and picking up new ways. Find ultimate significance and meaning in the ways of Jesus. But it will never be done by us shaming or ridiculing or placing heavy burdens to break somebody. But it will always be done in compassion, mercy, patience, and gentleness. Because as we keep company with Jesus, then he changes us. We take in his way of being to our lives and we will increasingly become people who are filled with compassion for those around us. I want to work this out a little bit. I want to massage this a little bit more to help us understand how this compassion really gets worked out into our fellowship. In particular, the story of the prodigal son and the father's response. To take a closer look at the father's response here. And I want to do it by asking, how do we allow that to may be more at home with us in our gatherings on the weekends. First, I want you to notice the compassion of patience, that the father waited patiently for his son, didn't demand perfection, but he waited patiently for his son to return. Notice this loving patience a desire for repentance, but there was patience along the way. I wonder what it would look like for us to be a place that didn't demand perfection, that desired repentance, but didn't demand perfection, and were patient with one another along the way. Second thing I want us to notice in this story is the compassion of seeing, of seeing. 
Again, Jesus says, while he was a long way off, the Father saw him. You know that there's great compassion in knowing that you're not invisible. You know that there's great love in being known that you are not forgotten, that you're not alone, that you're not by yourself. The way of Jesus is the way of seeing other people, noticing them, to, to have our eyes be out ever scanning and to see someone where they are and the hurt of where they are, the burdens that they carry with them, to, to see them. There's compassion when our eyes are lifted and caring for other people. See, the way of Jesus as depicted in this prodigal son story, had his eyes looking and he saw his son. And while his son had done something wrong, his sin did not stop the father from looking and seeing him. His sin, his wrongdoing did not cause the father to turn a cold shoulder on him. He didn't cause him to give up on him. And he didn't stop, see, he didn't cease to be his son but his eyes were watching. See, there's compassion when we are patient with one another. Then there's compassion in seeing one another and communicating by seeing one another that you, no matter how far you may have drifted, you have not ceased to be loved by God. You are still his beloved. You are still made in his image and his likeness. And he sees, and he knows your name, and he knows what you've been through. See, there's great compassion in not only being patient, but in seeing, having eyes to see. But there's a third one I'd like you to have, too. And that is the compassion of bestowed love. Not only does the Father demonstrate patience, not only does the Father see him for a long way off, but he runs to him. Picks him up in a full embrace and kisses him. He bestows love on his son. His son knows that he's done wrong and he has no right to ask to be a son any longer. But notice what the father does. Holds him. And he tells him, like he can only tell him that, son, you've never stopped being loved. You've never stopped being my son. You've never been stopped being loved. You are not forgotten. I didn't give up on you. I didn't turn a cold shoulder. You are my beloved. And it is the compassion of Jesus that leads him to repentance and a transformed life. It's the patience and the merciful seeing and it's the embrace and it's the bestowed love. It is the compassion of God that leads to repentance. And in that way, Jesus is demonstrating the heart of the Father and the heart of any of his gatherings, gatherings that bear his name will be a place where we are patient with one another where we have eyes to see one another, that you're not just a number or not just a person coming in or out, but you are not forgotten and that you are one of God's beloved, made in his likeness, a place that regularly, weekly reminds us that we are loved by God. That we walk in here, each one of us walk in here with a truckload of insecurities and ways in which we feel like we don't measure up, ways in which we feel like we're failing. We're failing our families, we're failing at our job, we're failing our spouse, we're failing in all sorts of other ways. But we come into this place and we need to hear that we are God's beloved. You have not stopped being loved by God because you feel like you failed in some way. You and I are loved with an immense kind of love that you cannot run from. And that is at the heart of God. It's the heart of God. Let me try and make it a little more personal. 
whether you have been here for a long time or you haven't been here for very long at all, whether you've been pursuing Jesus for decades or just minutes, what do you think about when you think about God? What, what picture comes to your mind when you think about God? What does his face look like when he's seeing you? What is, what is his posture towards you? Can I invite you? Can I invite you this morning to hear and to see the posture of Jesus in this prodigal son story? That you are created uniquely in his image, that you bear his image, his likeness. You are one on whom God has not given up on, but he has seen you and he knows your name and you are one in whom God delights. And what we see this morning as we lean in to the story of the prodigals, we learn to see who God is in our life. God is patient with you. It's not demanding perfection. He's patient with you. He's been watching, eagerly anticipating your arrival. And while you may feel like you don't deserve to be his son or his daughter, he sees you while you were a far way off and he has run to you and picked you up and full embrace and he has whispered in your ear, you are my beloved. And you've never stopped, you've never stopped being my beloved. That's the compassion of Jesus. And that grips us in our heart and it changes us how we see ourselves and how we see others and how we operate this church we want to live in a distinctly different way and that makes all the difference and when we learn to live that way with friends we won't just give we won't just say or give good news we will be good news and we will speak life into places that are dead and dying I want to leave you this morning with an image. It's a sculpture by Charlie Mackesy. And as you look at this, what does it remind you of? As you think about your life with God, what does it invite you to become? What does it invite us to do? As I thought about you guys this week as I was preparing, I know that there are all sorts of ways in which we feel like we are inferior where we don't measure up or where we've been failing at times. Sometimes those are just under the surface and sometimes we push them way down, but I know that there are times when we feel like we don't have what it takes. And maybe you've heard it since you were born, but would you hear it again today? You are loved by God. And so am I. You are one in whom God delights. And he sees you. And he's patient with you. He's never overbearing. And while he invites us to a transformed life, it's always through grace and mercy and compassion and love. You are God's beloved. Let me pray for us, and then Jason and the worship team will lead us. God, we need you.
I pray for us and this fellowship and this place would be known as a place that is full of compassion, tender-hearted mercy, gentleness. I pray that we would receive that from you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen.